Chapter 18 The Study of the Negro The facts drawn from an experience of more than 20 years enable us to make certain deductions with respect to the study of the Negro. Only one Negro out of every 10,000 is interested in the effort to set forth what his race has thought and felt and attempted and accomplished that it may not become a negligible factor in the thought of the world. By traditions and education, however, the large majority of Negroes have become interested in the history and status of other races, and they spend millions annually to promote such knowledge. Along with this sum should be considered the large amount paid for devices in trying not to be Negroes. The chief reason why so many give such a little attention to the background of the Negro is the belief that this study is unimportant. They consider as history only such deeds as those of Mussolini, who after building up an efficient war machine with the aid of other Europeans would now use it to murder unarmed and defenseless Africans who have restricted themselves exclusively to attending to their own business. If Mussolini succeeds in crushing a Byzania, he will be recorded in history among the Caesars, and volumes written in praise of the conqueror will find their way to the homes and libraries of thousands of miseducated Negroes. The oppressor has always indoctrinated the weak with this interpretation of the crimes of the strong. The warlords have done good only accidentally or incidentally while seeking to do evil. The movements which have ameliorated the condition of humanity and stimulated progress have been inaugurated by men of thought in lifting their fellows out of drudgery onto ease and comfort, out of selfishness onto altruism. The Negro may well rejoice that his hands, unlike those of his oppressors, are not stained with so much blood extracted by brute force. Real history is not the record of successes and disappointments. The vices, the follies, and the quarrels of those who engage in contention for power. The Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is projected on the fact that there is nothing in the past of the Negro more shameful than what is found in the past of other races. The Negro is as human as the other members of the family of mankind. The Negro, like others, has been up at times, and at times he has been down. With the domestication of animals, the discovery of iron, the development of stringed instruments, an advancement in fine art, and the inauguration of trial by jury to his credit, the Negro stands just as high as others in contributing to the progress of the world. The oppressor, however, raises his voice to the contrary. He teaches the Negro that he has no worth while past, that his race has done nothing significant since the beginning of time, and that there is no evidence that he will ever achieve anything great. The education of the Negro then must be carefully directed lest the race may waste time trying to do the impossible. Lead the Negro to believe this and thus control his thinking. If you can thereby determine what he will think, you will not need to worry about what he will do. You will not have to tell him to go to the back door. He will go without being told. And if there is no back door, he will have one cut for his special benefit. If you teach the Negro that he has accomplished as much good as any other race, he will aspire to equality and justice without regard to race. Such an effort would upset the program of the oppressor in Africa and America. Play up before the Negro, then, his crimes and shortcomings. Let him learn to admire the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, and the Teuton. Lead the Negro to detest the man of African blood, to hate himself. The oppressor, then, may conquer exploit, oppress, and even annihilate the Negro by segregation without fear or trembling. With the truth hidden, there will be little expression of thought to the contrary. The American Negro has taken over an abundance of information which others have made accessible to the oppressed, but he has not yet learned to think and plan for himself as others do for themselves. Well might this race be referred to as the most docile and tractable people on earth. This means that when the oppressors once start the large majority of the race in the direction of serving the purposes of their traducers, the task becomes so easy in the years following that they have little trouble with the masses thus controlled. It is a most satisfactory system 
and it has become so popular that European nations of foresight are sending some of their brightest minds to the United States to observe the Negro in an action, in order to learn how to deal likewise with Negroes in their colonies. What the Negro in America has become satisfied with will be accepted as the measure of what should be allotted him elsewhere. Certain Europeans consider the solution of the race problem in the United States one of our great achievements. The miseducated Negro joins the opposition with the objection that the study of the Negro keeps alive questions which should be forgotten. The Negro should cease to remember that he was once held a slave, that he has been oppressed, and even that he is a Negro. The traducer, however, keeps before the public such aspects of this history as will justify the present oppression of the race. It would seem that the Negro should emphasize at the same time the favorable aspects to justify action in his behalf. One cannot blame the Negro for not desiring to be reminded of being the sort of creature that the oppressor has represented the Negro to be. But this very attitude shows ignorance of the past and a slavish dependence upon the enemy to serve those whom he would destroy. The Negro can be made proud of his past only by approaching it scientifically himself and giving his own story to the world. What others have written about the Negro during the last three centuries has been mainly for the purpose of bringing him where he is today and holding him there. The method employed by the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, however, is not spectacular propaganda or fire-eating agitation. Nothing can be accomplished in such fashion. Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. The Negro, whether in Africa or America, must be directed toward a serious examination of the fundamentals of education, religion, literature, and philosophy as they have been expounded to him. He must be sufficiently enlightened to determine for himself whether these forces have come into his life to bless him or to bless his oppressor. After learning the facts, the Negro must develop the power of execution to deal with these matters as do people of vision. Problems of great importance cannot be worked out in a day. Questions of great moment must be met with far-reaching plans. The Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is teaching the Negro to exercise foresight rather than hindsight. Liberia must not wait until she is offered to Germany before realizing that she has a few friends in Europe. Abysnia must not wait until she is invaded by Italy before she prepares for self-defense. A scientific study of the past of modern nations which show these selfish tendencies as inevitable results from their policies in dealing with those whom they have professed to elevate. For example, much of Africa has been conquered and subjugated to save souls. How expensive has been the Negro salvation? One of the strong arguments for slavery was that it brought the Negro into the light of salvation. And yet, the Negro today is all but lost. The Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, however, has no special brand for the solution of the race problem except to learn to think. No general program of uplift for the Negroes in all parts of the world will be any more successful than such a procedure would be in the case of members of other races under different circumstances. What will help a Negro in Alabama may prove harmful to one in Maine. The African Negro may find his progress retarded by applying methods used for the elevation of the Negro in America. A thinking man learns to deal wisely with conditions as he finds them rather than to take orders from someone who knows nothing about his status and cares less. At present, the Negro, both in Africa and America, is being turned first here and there experimentally by so-called friends who in the final analysis assist the Negro merely in remaining in the dark. In the furtherance of the program of taking up these matters dispassionately, the association has made available an outline for the systematic study of the Negro as he has touched the life of others and as others have functioned in their relation to him. The African Background Outlined, a handbook. This book is written from the point of view of history, literature, art, education, religion, and economic imperialism. In 17 chapters, as part one of the work, a brief summary of the past in Africa is presented, and courses on the Negro in Africa, the Negro in the European mind, the Negro in America, 
the Negro in literature, the Negro in art, the education of the Negro, the religious development of the Negro, and economic imperialism follow as part two with ample bibliographical comments for every heading and subhead of these outlines. This facilitates the task of clubs, young people's societies, and special classes organized where the oppressors of the race and the Negroes cooperating with them are determined that the history and status of the Negro shall not be made a part of the curricula. In this outline, there is no animus, nothing to engender race hate. The association does not bring out such publications. The aim of this organization is to set forth facts in scientific form, for facts properly set forth will tell their own story. No advantage can be gained by merely inflaming the Negro's mind against his traducers. In a manner, they deserve to be congratulated for taking care of their own interests so well. The Negro needs to become angry with himself because he has not handled his own affairs wisely. In other words, the Negro must learn from others how to take care of himself in this trying ordeal. He must not remain content with taking over what others set aside for him and then come in the guise of friends to subject even that limited information to further misinterpretation. Appendix Much Ado About a Name A participant who recently attended a historical meeting desired to take up the question as to what the race should be called. Africans? Negroes? Colored people? Or what? This is a matter of much concern to him because he hopes thereby to solve the race problem. If others will agree to call Negroes Nordics, he thinks he will reach the desired end by taking a shortcut. This may sound all but insane, but there are a good many highly educated Negroes who believe that such can be accomplished by this shift in terminology, and they have spent time and energy in trying to effect a change. Many of this class suffer mentally because of the frequent use of offensive expressions in addressing Negroes. When dealing with them, one has to be very careful. For this reason, our friends in other races have to seek guidance in approaching us. For example, Lady Simon, the wife of Sir John Simon of the British Cabinet, has recently asked an American Negro what his people prefer to be called, and later in England she took up the same matter with another member of this race. Being an advocate of freedom, she has written considerably to advance its cause. She would not like to use in her works an expression which may hurt someone's feelings. Although a student of social problems, this learned woman cannot fathom this peculiar psychology. Americans must confess the difficulty of understanding it, unless it is that the highly educated Negro mind tends to concern itself with trifles rather than with the great problems of life. We have no Negroes to ask for a separate YMCA or YWCA, a separate church or a separate school, and then object to calling the institution colored or Negro. These segregationists have compromised on principle, but they are unwilling to acknowledge their crime against justice. The name, they believe, will save them from the disgrace. It does not matter so much what the thing is called as what the thing is. The Negro would not cease to be what he is by calling him something else. But if he will struggle and make something of himself and contribute to modern culture, the world will learn to look upon him as an American rather than as one of an undeveloped element of the population. The word Negro or Black is used in referring to the particular element because most persons of native African descent approach its color. The term does not imply that every Negro is Black and the word white does not mean that every white man is actually white. Negroes may be colored, but many Caucasians are scientifically classified as colored. We are not all Africans, because many of us were not born in Africa. And we are not all Afro-Americans, because few of us are natives of Africa transplanted to America. There is nothing to be gained by running away from the name. The names of practically all races and nations at times have connoted insignificance and low social status. Anglos and Saxons, once the slaves of Romans, experienced this, and even the name of the Greek for a while meant no more than this to these conquerors of the world. The people who bore these names, however, have made them grand and illustrious. 
the Negro must learn to do the same. It is strange that while the Negro feels ashamed of his name, persons abroad do not usually think of it in this sense. One does not find in Europe a number of West Indian and American Negroes of some Caucasian blood, who do not want to be known as Negroes. As a rule, a European of African Negro blood feels proud of this racial heritage and delights to be referred to as such. The writer saw a striking case of this in London in the granddaughter of a Zulu chief. She is so far removed from the African type that one could easily mistake her for a Spaniard. And yet, she thinks only for her African connection and gets her inspiration mainly from the story of her people beyond the Pillars of Hercules. The writer was agreeably surprised a few days later when he met a prominent Parisian with the same attitude. He has produced several volumes in which he champions the cause of the Negro because he has in his veins the same blood. A well-to-do European woman, the daughter of a Dutchman and an African mother, is similarly enthusiastic over her Negro blood. The first thing she mentioned in conversing with the writer was that black mother. This young woman expressed the regret that she did not have more of that color that she too might say as do members of certain tribes of Africa. I am black and comely. I am black and beautiful. I am beautifully black. These people surprise you when you think of the attitude of many American Negroes on this question. These race conscious people can think, but it is seldom that the American Negro indulges in such an exercise. He has permitted other people to determine for him the attitude that he has toward his own people. This means the enslavement of his mind and eventually the enslavement of his body. Some Europeans rather regard the word Negro as romantic. Going now along the streets of Paris, one will see advertised such places as I Elan Noir and the Café Au Negre de Toulouse. Walking along a street in Geneva not long ago, the writer's attention was attracted to something of the sort, which is still more significant. It was a wholesale coffee house called A la Casse de l'Oncle Tom. He entered and asked, Why did you give this store such a name? The proprietress laughed and explained that her grandfather, Francois Prudhomme, who had read Uncle Tom's Cabin and had been deeply impressed thereby, selected this name for the store when he established it in 1866. The Value of Color Not long ago, the writer saw on a street ear one of the prettiest women in the world. She was a perfectly black woman, becomingly dressed in suitable gray and modest adornments which harmonized with her color. She was naturally a commanding figure without any effort to please others, for her bearing was such that she would not fail to attract attention. He could not restrain himself from gazing at her, and looking around to see whether others were similarly concerned, he found the whites in the car admiring her also, even to the point of commenting among themselves. This woman's common sense, manifested in knowing how to dress, had made her color an asset rather than a liability. The writer easily recalled that tribe in Africa that feels unusually proud of being black. We are told that they are so anxious to be black that if they find one of the group with a tendency to depart the least from this color, they go to the heart of nature and extract from it its darkest dye and paint therewith that native's face that he may continue perfectly black. Here in America, we are ashamed of being black. So many of us who are actually black powder our faces and make ourselves blue. In doing so, we become all but hideous by the slavish aping of those around us in keeping with our custom of imitation. We fail to take ourselves for what we are actually worth and do not make the most of ourselves. We show lack of taste in the selection of our dress. We long for what others wear, whether it harmonizes with our color or not. They have given particular attention to design with respect to their race and have written books to this effect. Thinking that the Negro is not supposed to wear anything but what the poor may pick up, the artists have not thought seriously of him. Both teachers and students of nearby schools, thus concerned, repeatedly appeal to us for help in the study of design with respect to the Negro, but we have nothing scientific to offer them. We have no staff of artists 
who can function in this sphere. To be able to supply this need requires the most painstaking effort to understand colors and color schemes. It is a very difficult task because of the variation of color within the race. Sometimes, in one family of ten, you will hardly find two of the same shade. To dress them all alike may be economical, but the world thereby misses that much of beauty. The Negro mother needs to be the real artist, and the schools now training the youth to be the parents of tomorrow should give as much attention to these things aesthetic as they do to language, literature, or mathematics. In neglecting to know himself better from this point of view, the Negro is making a costly mistake. He should be deeply concerned with the aesthetic possibilities of his situation. In this so-called Negro race, we have the prettiest people in the world, when they dress in harmony with the many shades and colors with which we are so richly endowed. Why do we sew away from home to find what we already have on hand? Recently, one saw in Washington a demonstration of the value of color when the Masonic Conclave staged the tremendous parade in this national city. The whites were attracted to the upstanding, outstanding Negroes so becomingly bedecked in costumes of the Orient. This, however, was accidental. The color of the Negroes happened to be Oriental, and the colors of this order were originally worked out to suit the people of those parts. The dead white of the Caucasian does not harmonize with such garb. Why, then, should the Negro worry about what others wear? Carrying the imitation of others to an extreme today, we do not find ourselves far in advance of the oppressed antebellum Negroes who, unable to dress themselves, had to take whatever others threw at them. We make a most hideous spectacle when we are on dress parade in our social atmosphere. So many of us, clad in unbecoming colors, often look like decorated pet horses turned loose for an hour or so of freedom. Appreciating the value of color, the artists in European cities are trying to change their hue to that of the colored people. They can understand how inexpressive the dead white is, and they are trying to make use of what we are seeking to conceal. The models in their shops are purposely colored to display to good effect the beautiful costumes which require color. Some of these Europeans frankly tell Negroes how they envy them for their color. One is not surprised to find European cafes and hotels employing American or African Negroes to supply this color which the Europeans lack. Pictures of such black men are sometimes displayed to great effect. That of Josephine Baker adorns the windows of large stores in Paris. Here in America, we observe that art centers are likewise getting away from the dead white to enjoy the richness of color. The writer felt somewhat encouraged recently when he talked with a Washington lady who runs the Pandora, a unique establishment devoted to design. Upon inquiring about her progress in the effort to teach colored people how to wear what becomes them, she reported considerable success. Sometimes, customers insist on purchasing unbecoming attire, but usually she has shown them the unwisdom of so doing, and most of them now take her advice. In this way, this enterprising woman is not only conducting a pioneer business, but she is rendering a social service. She has not had any special training in this work, but on her initiative, she is building upon what she has learned by studying the Negroes in her community. Others of us may do likewise if we try to help the Negro rather than exploit him.